Hi, everybody. Welcome. I hope everyone was able to find some Rioja this week. Um, and, uh, and we have it in our glasses, I certainly hope, as well, and enjoying that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and we're just going to, you know, enjoy a little bit about Rioja. Let's just start off with a nice sip and a salud to all. So salud. Happy Wednesday, you guys. <laughs> Oh gosh. So yeah, um, for those of you who didn't see, I am drinking a really, really lovely um, Monte Riejo, or um, uh, yes, uh, Monte Real, I'm sorry, Grand Reserva. It's, um, it's, it's a delicious, delicious uh, Rioja. And one of the fun things about, um, that we'll learn about Rioja is the different aging levels. So if you are a fan of older wines, um, which many of us are, but we don't always have the opportunity to enjoy. Yes, Pago Florentino, that's right. <laughs> I know how much you guys love it. Nice, Dan. Muga Reserva, excellent. But when we like our, our aged wines and they can be hard to get at a good value, this is where Rioja starts to be one of the most incredible, incredible places uh, to find wines. So, uh, and the wines are just, just so beautiful. So I'm really excited to share. Okay, you guys, so. Without further ado, let's get started with our Rioja. So partially what we've got here um, is a region where tradition and modernity, I know that's a funny word. I, whenever I say it, it always sounds kind of funny, but uh, tradition and modernity are really about kind of coming together in this region because you have so much um, history here. Uh, not just as, uh, as part of Spain, but as a wine growing region. So when we talk about the different regions of Spain, um, Rioja is really up there as one of the most important, um, important uh, kind of regions that there are in Spain and one of the very oldest. But first of all, we're going to start. Welcome to Rioja, everyone. So first of all, where are we now in the world? We're, of course, in Spain. Um, and we are located in the northeast Spain, um, closer to not quite at the Pyrenees, because we have a whole couple of uh, provinces between us and the Pyrenees here. But we are located northeast Spain, along with the Ebro River. And the Ebro River, the Ebro River, actually, correct pronunciation, this is probably the most dominant geographic feature that we're going to talk about that has the biggest impact on this particular region. So uh, this Rioja region of Spain um, is centered around the province's capital city of Logroño. Uh, the interesting thing about um, <laughs> Rioja and Spain, the way that it's broken up is that Spain has essentially 17 different autonomous regions within the country itself on the Iberian Peninsula, right? All three separate things. So in uh, Rioja, Rioja DOCA, which we're going to talk about, is the part of Spain where the wine comes from that we drink of that we drink and know of as Rioja. But there's also a province that is called La Rioja, um, which uh, most of the wine growing region of Rioja Diocia is part of that province. It's also part of two other provinces as well. So that can get a little confusing. But the, uh, the province's capital is the city of Logroño. Um, it's a super historic city and you have like, for example, this is the really beautiful original home of the Marquez de Murrieta, who we're going to talk about just a little bit. Some of you may be drinking his wine, in fact. Um, so it's a, it's a very, very popular and a very recognizable bottle um, that you'll you'll see in, in many stores. Um, absolutely wonderful, worth it. I'm sorry, this is um, the Marquez de Riscal. This is his, uh, his um, home right here. Um, also a little lesser known, but one of the, the forefathers of our Rioja wines. Um, we've got basically the birthplace of Castile Spanish here. So Spanish is essentially, um, a, there are many different dialects um, within Spain. And any of you who have traveled there, you know that if you're in the Basque region versus uh, sort of uh, Catalonia, you have different spellings, you have different inflections of the language as well. So um, Castilian Spanish uh, is a very, very ancient one. Uh, language uh, that is a dialect of Spanish that is known particular to this region and this is considered the birthplace of it. So Rioja DOCA that we're going to talk about, um, in when the Spanish designate their wine regions in terms of quality, they have a system called the DO system. And um, that's the Designación de Origen, um, which is very similar to our AOC system in France or the DOC system in Italy. It's essentially a quality tiers that allow you as the consumer to recognize different levels of quality within the production level that comes out of the country. 
So the very, very highest level of that pyramid in Spain is the DOCA, Denominación de Origen Calificada. Um, in Spain, there are currently only two. It's very, very rare. So we've got the um, Rioja DOCA region, and then we've also got Priorat DOQ, because that has a different dialect, and that's in um, Catalan. So it's, uh, again, that kind of language, the change in the dialects throughout the country is really, really phenomenal. So moving along, the history of Rioja is absolutely fascinating because it really is one that is a, a defining principle of Spanish wine as we know it today in particular. Um, so when we talk about it, we want to look at the fact that even though Rioja as a wine region is completely landlocked, you actually have the origins of uh, the people from this community that were um, conquered by the Phoenicians. So the original tribes of the Iberian Peninsula that lived within the Rioja region were actually conquered by Phoenicians who arrived by boat, even though it is landlocked, because the Ebro River that flows up basically from the Cantabrian Mountains up in the north of the Rioja region all the way sort of southeast. It travels through the peninsula and empties out into the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians were able to reach Rioja via um, navigating the Ebro River basically upstream. And this was in the 11th century BCE. So the Phoenicians were sort of the early inhabitants of the region and um, one of the early uh, proponents, um, propagators of, of wine growing and all the uh, production of wine and drinking of wine. Of course, the, the Romans came later and really, really expanded the vineyard area and the, and the winemaking within the region. But um, Rioja, fast forwarding quite a bit, um, Rioja, when we talk about tradition, it was one of the very, very first regions to start putting quality uh, safeguards in place for their wines. So they were um, very much an export um, mecca for wines of Spain very, very early on in history. Um, and as early as uh, the 16th century, the late to mid 16th century, you saw that the, um, the authorities of the Rioja region were starting to put these regulations and, um, and safeguards in place to inherently protect their wines. Um, one of the things was that they, in, in the 1600s, now this is well before we get into any sort of designee or uh, quality designation zoning um, that we have that didn't, ex ex it didn't occur until the 20th century even. But um, in, in 1560, you have um, legislature being put out that Rioja wines could only be made from grapes sourced within the Rioja region. So that was a pretty um, remarkable uh, designation for the time. But in addition to that, they also had the, um, at the same time, oh, sorry guys. At the same time, they had um, the, um, they had a regulation about how the wine was transported as well. So uh, every wine from Rioja was required to be transported in a specific vessel uh, that was branded with a seal that designated its place of origin within Rioja. So these were really, really important measures that were taken before any other region, um, really in Spain and in very many places in the world. They were very, very highly uh, um, uh, protective of their wines and the quality of it. Um, in 1787, even, this was one of the first sort of consortiums, um, the Real uh, Sociedad Economica de Cosecheros de Rioja, which is essentially the economic, the Royal Economic Society of Rioja wine growers. And this was a group that was founded, again, in the late 18th century, um, that was really uh, there and produced um, to regulate and monitor the, uh, the vine cultivation and the wine production of the region, which is really, really fantastic. Um, the clay, the vessels were actually wood. So they were, they were wooden vessels, even back then. Um, they used the wooden, not the barrels that we are know of and are familiar with today, but they were the vessels that um, had the branded seals on them. So uh, coming along too from there, we've got the moving forward again into the 19th century, we start to see a big turn. So up until this point, Rioja is a huge export region for Spain, and they're known for producing really high quality wines. Um, then we have a very, very interesting turn of events take place in Spain in the early 18th century. So we have basically, um, <laughs> they were um, basically within the um, uh, early 19th century, the 1800s, you have uh, a lot of disruption and a lot of civil unrest within Spain. There's something called the Carlist Wars. There were actually three separate wars that took place between 1833 and in 1876. And this was a time, especially in Northeast Spain, of a lot of volatility, a lot of violence. So a lot of people actually left uh, Spain during this time for protection. 
And there were two actually really important winemakers that took refuge in Bordeaux during these, this uh, period in the early 1800s. And this was the Marques de Riscal and the Marques de Morieta. Um, they, later known as the Marques, they, um, they originally went to Bordeaux to study winemaking um, during the time that their, their homeland was in unrest. And so then they actually came back to Spain after learning the winemaking techniques of Bordeaux. And they were the ones that originally brought back the practices and traditions that are very, very common and still in use today. So that includes things like the uh, 225 liter barrique that is classic to Bordeaux, that it was introduced to Rioja specifically. Um, and also the uh, different sort of techniques in terms of winemaking as well, um, like, uh, like less, less oxygen, during uh, fermentations, cooler fermentations, ways to sort of enhance the quality of the wine. They brought these, um, these winemaking techniques back with them. Um, and then also what happened uh, sort of conversely is after the Spanish started coming back to Rioja to make their wine in the way that they learned in Bordeaux, France started having really big issues with powdery mildew and phylloxera essentially devastating their vineyards. So at this point, it was very interesting because you had a whole bunch of French winemakers now leaving France to come over to Spain and then start making their own wine because they couldn't make it in France anymore since their vineyards were ravaged, their vineyards were being ravaged and basically um, just devastated by both disease and pests of the phylloxera. So the, then you have Bordelais winemakers setting up their own camp, hiring the Spanish winemakers as well, all working together to sort of create this unification. So this is in your um, mid to late 1800s that this is happening. Um, and this continued during phylloxera. However, once phylloxera started to um, so recede in France, uh, the French winemakers of course went back. Um, but during the time they also sort of sourced wine from Spain to bring over and drink in France because they didn't have anything to drink there, right? <laughs> oh, sorry, Fred and Cheryl, were they casks? Um, yes, I believe they were. So the wooden, they were wooden casks. Although I have to be honest, thinking back to um, that particular period in time, I wouldn't be surprised if there were other forms of uh, vessels like that were made of, of potentially a clay vessel um, or something along those lines. I don't actually know the answer to that, to be perfectly honest, if it was exclusively wood barrels or if it was some other form as well. But the point was is that the vessels themselves were branded and named as for the Rioja region so that anyone receiving them would know the quality of the wines were authentic. Right. Um, so that was really kind of the takeaway from that. Um, in the 1800s, also, there was a huge um, there was a huge railway system that was put in that actually connected Rioja to other parts of Spain and also to France. And that helped to sort of explode um, exports of the region and the wines and just enhance their fame and well known um, quality abilities. So the region itself, when we talk geographically about Rioja, we, um, we are bordered to the north and south by mountains. So we have a very, very um, varied terrain in the Rioja region, especially in the north when you get into, uh, you're in the foothills of the mountain, you have a lot of altitude. So we have, see a very huge altitude variation based on how we follow along the region, which we'll look at a little bit in the next slide. But you have also the Ebro River, as we talked about, which is absolutely the defining feature of the, uh, the Rioja region. So the Ebro River is the longest river in mainland Spain. As I mentioned, it sort of starts in the Cantabrian Mountains, which you can see even in this picture right here, and it flows southeast through Spain and empties out into the Mediterranean. Um, it is not the longest river on the entire peninsula. There's actually a river called uh, the Tajo River, and you have that river was actually um, is the longest one in the peninsula, but because it goes through Portugal, uh, the part that's at in mainland Spain is technically shorter than the Ebro itself. So when we're talking about the region as defined by the Ebro River, it is sometimes known as the zone of the seven valleys because there are various tributaries that lead into the Ebro River that create this entire region. Um, so it's a really, really um, important feature. As we know, the water has a lot of um, mitigating influences when it comes to climate, um, especially in the colder regions, you have a lot of airflow that's created by the movement of the water. And there's also, of course, uh, hydration that comes out of um, having the water nearby as well. So the climate that we have is also varied when we talk about Rioja because, again, we're going from higher altitudes in the north near the mountains to sort of uh, further south 
and southeast, we start to flatten out and we're going to have more of a warmer continental climate. Technically, the entire region is continental, but you'll see the north being influenced a little bit more by the Atlantic, meaning you get a little bit more um, colder weather in the wintertime, you get a little bit more um, weather, frost, rains and stuff that are coming out of the north and um, out of the Atlantic. Um, but generally speaking, the entire region really enjoys milder autumns and good harvest times. Um, as you get a little bit further into the south, into the southern region of uh, the Rioja um, DOCA, you start to see warmer, more um, Mediterranean influence into the continental climate, just meaning more moderate overall between uh, winter and fall in terms of the temperature and rainfall. Um, you get more rainfall in the north as well. And again, when we're looking at the altitude ranges and when we're into the, the foothills of the Cantabrian ranges in the north, 3,000 feet above sea, sea level is very significant, especially when it comes to um, creating that kind of little um, uh, in, when it comes to seeing the uh, temperatures shift diurnally. So the higher you get in altitude, the lower your temperature gets. And also the larger those diurnal swings that can happen between daytime and nighttime. So the nighttime um, in the evenings, when you have the cooler temperatures, that's what helps to give the grapes a chance to take a longer time ripening, develop more aromas and flavors, and retain the acidity that's in the grapes. So you have a really, really an enviable growing region overall because it really has a um, an ideal climate for a lot of quality grape growing. Um, hi, Dawn. I know I'm so sorry. The slides actually aren't on uh, Instagram Live. You just have to listen to my voice. But in the future, you can always sign up and go on to uh, to follow along with the Zoom on my website. So when we talk about the Rioja zones, there are three sub zones that are in Rioja. We have got Rioja Alavesa, as you can see up here. Um, we, these are essentially the, this is the smallest subzone that's to the north. You have the, um, this is the Cantabrian range up here. So you have the Sierra de Cantabria um, right along the top. And then you have, of course, the Ebro River that flows right down through the entire kind of north center of Rioja DOCA. Um, Rioja Alavesa is actually not within the province of La Rioja in Spain. It is completely within the Alava province of Pais Vasco, which is an entirely separate autonomous region. So crazy, right? Um, but it is also the smallest growing region, the one the growing region, the one with the highest amount of elevation, um, the one that gets the coldest temperatures that are coming down from the north. And you have a lot of Tempranillo that's planted here that is south facing. So you can get the um, ripeness from the sun and the south facing sun, but then you also are able to um, have the uh, the cool temperatures that are coming down from the night. So it's really ideal for ripening Tempranillo in particular. Um, the, there are small amounts of Garnacha and Graciano planted in the Rioja Alavesa region, but to be perfectly honest, it's mostly Tempranillo up here and it's very, very high quality Tempranillo. Um, and this is the smallest region, both geographically and also in terms of planting. So you have only about 21% of vineyards that are planted within Rioja Alavesa. It's pretty prime territory for a good Rioja to be perfectly honest. Um, and then you've got Rioja Alta. So that's just to the south. And this is also mostly within the province of um, La Rioja in Spain, the autonomous region. And so Rioja Alta is um, a, a much larger region, especially in terms of production. So here's where you find the most vineyards in Rioja overall. And again, we're talking mostly Tempranillo. Um, it's also really cool because it's the most historic region of Spain. Some of the most important um, and the, the oldest wineries and some of the oldest vineyards are actually found within Rioja Alta. So you have a, a huge history, a huge amount of tradition that is really based here within this particular region and a really, really high volume of uh, quality wine that comes out of here as well, um, especially when you're talking about those older vineyards and the older wineries. Um, there's also, and we'll talk about this, there is uh, three different types of soils that are generally found within um, the Rioja region overall. Uh, within Rioja Alavesa, you have mostly these limestone soils, these are calcareous clay soils. Um, within Rioja Alta, you see all different kinds of soils. There's basically all three types, which is that calcareous um, limestone soil, the ferrous clay, which is sort of an iron rich clay that exists here as well, and then alluviums, which are sort of your more um, alluvial soils, sort of more fertile soils as well. Um, these are all three found throughout Rioja Alta, so it is very, very diverse in terms of the type of wines that it can produce, right? 
So, and then at the bottom, we have Rioja Oriental. So geographically, this is our biggest region in terms of land mass, but not in terms of vineyards. It's slightly less uh, in vineyard area than with Rioja Alta. But here you also have, this is where we start to see a lot of um, more warmth coming in. The Rioja, the Rioja Oriental region used to be known as Rioja Baja. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that, uh, with the name Rioja Baja. But actually, um, in 2018, the name was officially changed because the region technically took a little, um, they took offense to the name because they felt like Baja, which means low in Spanish, was derogatory to the, to the quality of the wine. So in this particular case, they decided the best measure moving forward would be to go ahead and um, uh, change the name to Rioja Oriental, which essentially means east, because we're technically the most east part of the Rioja region. And here is, um, it's the warmest subzone, it's the driest subzone. And what's really interesting is that we always associate Tempranillo with Rioja, because that's very the classic grape of the region, and it is the main grape of both Rioja Alavesa and Rioja Alta. But when you get into Rioja Oriental, the main grape varietal here is actually Garnacha, because it does better in this warmer climate. And, and they make absolutely beautiful. Um, um, the zones are sometimes designated on the label, but it's not required. So a lot of times wineries may identify, um, these are our vineyards from Rioja Alavesa or from Rioja Alta. Um, there's a whole separate nomenclature in terms of how to, um, there's zoning, um, there are, uh, there's basically a whole quality tier within the zones as well that may appear on the label. But again, this is an additional designation that is simply um, optional to the winemakers. So sometimes you can find it, but a lot of times it won't be listed on there. And a lot of times too, um, you have winemakers that are sourcing from all three different subzones because that's absolutely legal. It's all still part of Rioja. So it might not be exclusively from one subzone or another, but these different subzones can add different um, features and qualities and and um, to the wine itself. So as a winemaker, blending is your best tool for creating that perfect, perfect wine that you imagine in your head, right? So some grapes from Rioja Alavesa mixed with a little bit of Garnacha from Rioja Oriental might create the perfect wine that you want to express and put into your bottle. So um, again, when we talk about the grapes, this is kind of the most fun and important part because uh, again, the primary varietals of the Rioja region are absolutely 100% Tempranillo. <laughs> But Garnacha Tinta is a very, very important varietal here. And it's the most interesting thing about the Garnacha Tinta is that it actually wasn't even planted in Rioja until after Phylloxera struck. So, of course, when Phylloxera struck France, you know, all the French winemakers came over to Spain to make wine and drink wine. But eventually Phylloxera came over to Rioja. The good thing was that by that time they had already figured out how to... Um, how to handle that, they figured out how to fix it. They knew that now grafting on to the American rootstock would solve the problem. So you have this opportunity for, uh, to, for replanting. And it was at this point that a lot of vineyards were uh, chosen to be replanted with Garnacha. Instead of um, below, we have a couple of lesser varietals that are used within the Rioja region, which are Graciano and Mazuelo. And we'll talk about those in just a second. But to be very, let's start off, of course, with the noble varietal of Rioja, which is Tempranillo. So Tempranillo is a Spanish indigenous varietal. So uh, most likely everyone in their glass right now probably has a Tempranillo-based um, wine. And um, pretty much the, the beauty of Tempranillo is kind of, it has this wonderful, wonderful red fruit character, right? It's it's a lot of, you'll get cherries, oftentimes you'll get some raspberry in there. Sometimes you might get a little bit more plum into it and usually a little bit of a spice, like a peppery note to it, right? Um, but what Tempranillo does really, really well is that it actually ages beautifully, which is part of what makes it the ideal grape for Rioja. Because Rioja, which we'll talk about, is really focused on the, the aging process and sort of defining its characteristics and its appeal. So Tempranillo, in fact, does very well with oak and oak use. So as part of the winemaking regimen, which it is in most of Rioja, Tempranillo just does really, really well. And as it ages, it starts to develop a lot of those tertiary aromas and flavors that we've talked about before. So you'll get things like tobacco leaf, you'll get things like leather or like deeper, darker spices, more earthiness. And so you get a very, very old world style wine a lot of times from aged Tempranillo and especially from Rioja. So if everyone wants to just sort of take a whiff of their glass right now, 
you've probably got um, like I'm getting a really sort of beautiful like black raspberry almost. I'm getting darker fruit from my particular one, but I am getting a whole bunch of that kind of leather note, that sort of uh, clovey spice a little bit and just a wonderful, wonderful earthy tone um, along with uh, these touches of vanilla and sort of herbs, herbs and spices as well. Uh, so we'll talk about where all that comes from too, but a lot of it comes from the grape itself. Um, and Garnacha Tinta, um, we oftentimes have know it, yes, tons of tobacco leaf is a wonderful, wonderful quality about Tempranillo. Um, a lot of times with uh, Garnacha is also a Spanish native varietal. We know it also as Grenache a lot of times because that's the way it's referred to in France, that's the way it's referred to also in um, the, uh, in most parts of the world, for example, even in California, in Australia, in a lot of other places where Grenache is grown, it's referred to as Grenache as opposed to Garnacha, even though that is the original name for it because it is from Spain. So, um, and these are of course the, uh, this wonderful, wonderful varietal that does very, very well in warm weather. So partially this is why it was replanted so favorably within that Rioja Oriental subzone, because here's where you have those warmer temperatures, you have those slightly warmer summers um, and longer ripening seasons that do very, very well with Garnacha. And Garnacha, if anyone is not familiar with Garnacha, I highly recommend going out and drinking as much as you can. It's one of my favorite varietals. It tends to be very versatile. So whereas Tempranillo will tend to have a little bit more structure, um, a little bit more of this uh, beautiful kind of, um, it has a peppery quality as well, but uh, the Tempranillo will have a little bit more tannic structure to it, um, a little bit thicker skins. Uh, Garnacha tends to have thinner skins, which means a little less pigmentation than Tempranillo, but and a little bit less of that anthocyanin quality that also contributes to the tannins. So lower tannins, great acidity, usually some beautiful fruit, and higher alcohol, honestly, because these grapes ripen to a really, really wonderful uh, sugar level, uh, higher sugar levels, technically. So you tend to get highly, um, slightly more alcohol in your wines from Grenache or Garnachas. But this also makes it an ideal blending partner with that Tempranillo. It sort of softens it. It can balance it really, really beautiful in these Rioja wines, which is why it's been made, especially now and since the early 20th century, the main blending partner within Rioja. Before we move on to the other two red grapes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Viura, which is the main white varietal. And I know a lot of people do not think about white wine when they think about Rioja, but the white wines of Rioja, I think, are absolutely worth exploring because Viura is a very interesting varietal. It's, it's also known as Macabeo. Um, it's more commonly known as Macabeo, I should say. And Macabeo is, of course, one of the three main varietals that exists in Cava. So if you enjoy Cava, you've likely drunk quite a bit of Macabeo, um, known as Viura in Rioja. I know all the fun synonym names is just everywhere. <laughs> but um, the Viura grape is, is interesting in its similarities to Chardonnay in the sense that it tends to be a more neutral grape varietal. So it doesn't have a whole lot of aromatics, for example, like Sauvignon Blanc. It doesn't have a whole lot of um, uh, interesting um, petrol flavor, anything like Riesling, it tends to be a little bit more neutral, which means one of two things. You have to grow it correctly. You have to give it um, the correct kind of environment to retain the acidity um, and its freshness, especially. And um, you also get to work with it very well when it comes to the winery. Chardonnay is a very forgiving grape varietal, and so is Viura. They, they work well with oak. So as a winemaker, it's super versatile. You can oak it, you cannot oak it. Um, you can allow malolactic fermentation to happen. There's a lot of options in terms of creating a variety of styles with um, with Viura. However, the style that is most common today um, is really that sort of fresher style. Uh, the white wines have the same um, age designations as the red wines. When we talk about that, you'll see what those different levels are, but they don't require as much time in barrel for those particular designations. And you really don't see those kind of Reserva, Ground Reserva white wines as much. If you do, they're usually very, very high quality and pretty spectacular. They're just not made a whole lot anymore. And then our blending grapes um, that are a little lesser now, especially uh, Graciano and Mazuelo, and Mazuelo is also known as Carignana or Carignan, um, another native Spanish varietal. But starting with Graciano, Graciano is this dark varietal, really, really dark skins, darkly pigmented, that is very perfumed. Um, but unfortunately, it's really kind of hard to grow. It doesn't have high yields, so it was kind of abandoned in a lot of the um, in the Rioja replantings. Um, 
c'est la vie, but it is still found. And when you do find it, it adds a great, great structural element to the wines. Um, it gives a little bit more of that backbone. It does have that kind of firm um, structural component, great acidity, and really deepens the color. Because Tempranillo and both Tempranillo and Garnacha tend towards that sort of uh, garneting and that rusting color towards the, uh, the aging process as they get older. Uh, Graciano tends to retain a lot more of that pigmentation, that deep dark pigmentation over time. As does Mazuelo actually, Carinina does that as well. Um, but Mazuelo has sort of fallen out of favor in Rioja, it is still planted there, but it does much better in the south where you have these warm, warm weather. Uh, a lot more of these, uh, it's, it's a hot weather grape, similar to Garnacha, but even more so, right? It really, really thrives in a lot of the hot climate. So especially in the northern part of Rioja, it doesn't quite, um, you know, meet the, meet the expectations or the potential that you'd like for it in, in the wines. Okay, so moving on. Um, when we talk about Rioja wine, like I mentioned, we're probably talking about red wine. <laughs> I feel like everyone, and I do this too, like when you think Rioja, you think it's red. What else are you going to drink? Um, while they do have white wines and they do have rosés, actually, um, the majority, 90%, I mean, this is more than majority. It's pretty much all, almost all of the wine that comes out of Rioja is tinto or, you know, red. Um, so about 5% is white, about 5% is rosé. And like I said, those are much, much less um, available to us in particular, um, and just less likely to be found because the reds are really where you see the particular terroir and the particular style of winemaking for Rioja just sing and like do its best and make its magic, right? Um, Rioja is not only aged wine, even though it's the majority of what we think of it as, but it has a lot of styles and you have styles that range from very, very young, very, very fresh, all the way to complex complex and, and age and showing all of those deep, leathery, wonderful development notes that you get only from bottle age and only from um, waiting, right? Which is the hardest part about old wines is waiting to drink them. <laughs> but um, it is super interesting because the, these wine styles also have a history here and a tradition. Um, there's something called uh, cosecheros, which is essentially the name for the Spanish name for winemakers in Rioja. And they, they have uh, historically, the way that they used to produce wines in Rioja was actually just to um, make really, really young, fresh and fruity wines through the use of carbonic maceration. So you have a very, very interesting, um, an interesting winemaking technique, which we'll get into in another webinar, I promise. But um, the concept of carbonic maceration is a style of winemaking that essentially captures the very primary fruit essence of your grapes and your wine. So you're left with something that is just utterly fresh, utterly fruity, and it's usually the very, very um, first wine that can be made in the season because it doesn't have any aging whatsoever. Now, this was literally, the Cosecheros made this wine um, historically, and this is what they used to sell. It's not so much um, common to make these days, but they do have a, um, yes, exactly, like Beaujolais. They use that same process in Beaujolais where it's much better known, to be perfectly honest. Um, and when it was made here, it used to be very much the norm. Now it's basically the table wine that winemakers make for themselves to drink during, like right away during harvest because, you know, harvest is a thirsty work, man. We gotta find something to drink and the best thing to drink is wine. So um, this, this tradition is still present in Rioja, even though it's not as prominent on the world stage, it's part of that kind of um, history and tradition of the region that makes it so special. The other thing you have here is um, the fermentation techniques are historically very, very, again, when we talk about tradition versus modernity, the history of the fermentation techniques has changed dramatically over time in Rioja to uh, the advantage really of the region and the wines themselves. So um, when I mentioned about the Marques de Escal and the Marques de Morieta going to Bordeaux and coming back and bringing modern technique with them, one of the things was this uh, concept of sort of modern fermentation techniques. As we learned about the process of winemaking, we know that with red wine, you are fermenting the wine with the skins and the stems intact. So there's a, something called the cap that floats up. So all of the leaves, the, the, the skins of the grapes, um, any, any seeds or pulp or anything that's in the juice, the must itself, kind of rises to the top of the fermentation tank. And reintegrating that cap into the wine is essential for 
uh, extracting tannin, extracting flavor and color, and basically bringing complexity and flavor into your wine. So the techniques that they were using in France were not present in Rioja before um, the, the Marquesi the Marquez brought them back. That being said, um, additionally, Spain is generally a warmer place, even Rioja, than Bordeaux, for example. And they also learned that cooler fermentation allowed for a more subtle extraction and a more uh, fresh preservation of the grape juice, the must, and the flavors and aromas themselves. So by using a cooler fermentation method, they also reduced oxygen into the wine as another part of that during the fermentation process. And all of these things together helped create more age-worthy, more complex, and just higher quality wine in general. So these modern fermentation techniques that were introduced in the mid-1800s are, of course, the norm today. Most of the wines that um, you have, red, white, rosé, are all fermented in stainless steel. There's not a whole lot of barrel fermentation that happens in Rioja. Um, but the, uh, the truth is that the barrels obviously play a very important part in the aging of the wine. So Rioja, which we're getting into the next slide, is really defined by the sort of aging process within these 225 liter barriques that came, the size and style of those barriques came from Bordeaux, but the wood for Rioja traditionally comes from America, as it turns out. Um, even though France is so close, there was a, a period of time where there was more trade happening between Spain and America than there was between Spain and France, and they really, really liked that American oak, the style, the flavor profile that it gave, and so that became the norm for um, aging your wine in Rioja was to use American oak barrels. Um, today, there's a lot of combination going on. So while you do see still quite a bit of American oak, you're also seeing more French oak, and you're seeing a lot of wines that are partially aged in American oak and partially aged in French oak. So the difference between those two, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later this month when we talk about oak, um, they give different flavors and quality to the wine. They have different grains, and so they allow a different amount of oxygen during the aging process. And when you're talking you know, several years within barrel, that can make a big difference depending on what you're using and the flavors that it imparts into the wine, right? So, when we talk about Rioja age designations, this is where it's going to, you go to the wine store, you're like, what do I want? What kind of wine do I like the best? And this, these are essentially the levels uh, that you're gonna look at within your Rioja DOCA. You have your cosecha, which is the same as joven or generico, right? This is your youthful, fresh, no aging requirement for these wines, right? You just get to go ahead and they're made, um, they may even be made entirely in stainless steel. You might be having 100% Tempranillo or even 100% you know, Garnacha Tinta, all stainless, maybe just a little bit of oak, less than a year, just pretty much ready to go on the shelf, drink now, enjoy. And these are amazing value wines because they're not that expensive even over here. This is true of all of these levels. It's really incredible when you get to the higher aging levels, how um, what value you can find for really, really old wines. I mean, like I said, this guy, you know, I'm looking at, uh, this is my 2011, um, and this is, I think, it retails for like 40 bucks. You know, nine-year-old wine for 40 bucks, it's incredible. Um, so you've got the next level up in terms of aging requirements is what they call crianza. So this is your sort of uh, entry-level age-worthy Tempranillo and Garnacha from Rioja. So if it's a Crianza wine, if it says this on the barrel or on the bottle, I should say, uh, Crianza, it means that it is um, aged for a minimum of 12 months in barrel. And this can be American oak, it can be French oak, but it's the 225 liter Berry. And it has, they have to wait two years from harvest before they can release the wine. So you know every Crianza that you get is going to be a minimum of two years old. That means that every uh, our current vintage is going to be 2018, for example, right? Um, cosecha also just means harvest or year. So you see that on all the labels, you see the, the name, the word cosecha, that just means harvest year, and that henceforth, the uh, 2009, 2008. Um, the other thing about these labels that we're looking at too, uh, the trust seal, this is this a holographic looking sticker that actually appears on all the bottles. This was the first of its kind that was introduced in the late 20th century from Rioja. Um, another, an yet another way in which they are uh, ensuring the quality of their wines to the world, right? 
So our next level up is now Reserva. So we've started with Joven, then we have Crianza, and then you move on to Reserva. And Reserva now, you're getting into more aging requirements. So we actually have still the 12 months required in oak, any kind of oak, whatever they're using. Um, it requires six months in bottle. So this is an interesting addition. And why would they do that? Because sometimes that bottle aging, um, before you release it, can help for those flavors to sort of um, intermingle and for the wines to settle, right? So it's that idea of instead of just uh, um, leaving it in barrel and then releasing it, you have to have a minimum time in bottle. So reservas, you actually have to wait three years before releasing it. Um, but you're like, but what does that mean? So if it's only 12 months in barrel, but three years before I release it, then what happens between the other 18 months where it's not in bottle or barrel? That's up to the winemaker. So if you have a minimum three years before you can release the wine, you only have to do 12 months in barrel. But the truth is, is that most winemakers, especially in Rioja, they, they use a longer, um, they use longer time in barrel than is the minimum requirement. And a lot of these places actually just use longer than the minimum everything. So even though the, the Reserva uh, has a minimum of three years, many winemakers will not release the Reserva for four years or even five years because they don't wanna release it until it's ready to drink, right? That is how um, demanding they are and uh, meticulous they are about the quality of their wine. When it hits your glass, they want it to be absolutely perfect. So, and I appreciate that from them because it saves us the trouble of aging those wines in our cellars, right? <laughs> they already do it for us, it's wonderful. Um, and then finally, we have our sort of granddaddy level, which is the Grand Reserva wines. So these are the ones that require the most aging. They have the most strict requirements for aging. These require 24 months in barrel. They require 24 months in bottle. And it's a minimum five years before it can hit the shelf, uh, five years from harvest. But like I said, many places wait for um, many places wait for only uh, for five years, much, much longer than five years. Right. The minimum is oftentimes just totally blown past by many of these winemakers because they absolutely value waiting for that wine to reach its potential before they release it. Yes, the Reserva only $21. I mean, this is what we're talking about. So you have, you know, a minimum three-year-old wine. It's retailing uh, on a commercial shelf for 20 bucks. My Grand Reserva, no, there are definitely some Grand Reservas. You have 2009s, 2008s. The older they get, definitely, the, the more they will cost. But if you think about trying to find a Bordeaux, for example, that's 10 or 12 years old, and how much that would cost you versus what you would get from a Rioja wine that has already been aged for 10 or 12 years, the price points are going to be very, very different. Um, the, uh, the wine that I'm drinking, for example, this is the Montreal. Someone was just asking about that. The Montreal Grand Reserva, uh, 2011, 2009. Oh my gosh. It's the 2009, you guys. This wine is 11 years old and it was 40, 41 bucks. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you can't get anywhere else. Um, it's really, really exciting because again, those, those development flavors that only come with bottle age are so special um, and so usually expensive. But here, you know, in Rioja, you get to enjoy that right now. Yeah, 1996. And, and Suzanne, like how much did that cost you? Is probably, I, you don't have to answer that. Sorry, I'm not trying to get it. <laughs> but the point, everyone I think gets my point. The value here is incredible, especially if this is a style of wine that you like, that you appreciate, and that you, um, and that you enjoy drinking. So speaking of enjoying drinking, um, when you enjoy Rioja, it's an excellent value for older wines. <laughs> um, these beautiful, uh, as we've been talking about it, the leathery notes, that peppery kind of smoky quality um, that's partially from the, the bottle age, partially from the grape itself, and partially from the oak regimen that it's required to undergo. All of these things contribute to that overall very unique um, quality about Rioja wines. A lot of times that American oak, uh, some of the identifying factors that you'll, you'll hear when people are describing wines that are aged in American oak, sometimes you'll hear things like dill and coconut. Um, so you get a different kind of aroma profile from a lot of Riojas because of that, as a, compared to, for example, um, wines from Bordeaux, where you have a, an exclusive French oak regimen and you get more of those warming spices and a little bit more of that vanilla note, right? So you have, um, oh, that's lucky, Michael. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> 28 a bottle, cheers. Um, 
like I did meet uh, like the the versatility of these wines too because they're not generally um they have that bottle age which helps to kind of tame tannins they make them very very food friendly but especially that smoky peppery quality you're just just crying for grilled meats right like everyone go uh <laughs> fire up that grill right now and let's get some like steaks on there and some pork and some charred chicken um charred vegetables though too um mushrooms things like that it just it lends itself very well to earthy um hearty kind of rustic meals but that being said you have again that sort of a beautiful fruit quality that can go really nicely with the like um uh um uh, the plank salmon, right, on the grill as well. Cedar plank salmon was the word I was looking for. Imagine being able to pair that with a beautiful Rioja and some nice charred like broccolini as well. It would go lovely together. Um, the acidity is there and it definitely can hold up to a lot of different dishes and it's just delicious to drink on its own too, which is kind of fun. Um, and then again, I don't want to discount, even though we are talking exclusively pretty much about the red wines of Rioja, I encourage everyone to go ahead out and try and find a white Rioja, just a youthful one, just a young fresh one because I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised about the kind of like apple and citrus notes that you get with it but also a little bit of this kind of um just the freshness and the acidity and especially for summertime if I did have a white Rioja right now with the heat that's going on I would probably be drinking it right now but um I'm very much enjoying my red as well so um last but not least uh the final word on the slide is salud which is cheers <laughs> So everybody, thank you so much. That, that is our little chat on Rioja. Thank you guys all so much for joining. Um, I really, really appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, I would be happy to take them right now. Um, and in the meantime, if not, please feel free, head on out, have your dinner, drink your wine, anything you need to enjoy. Elaine, um, how we can tell the difference between clay and oak barrels. So um, the clay is not so much in use anymore. Um, oak is the prominent, predominant uh, aging vessel for Rioja, but if it's not oak, it's likely going to be stainless steel. So what that means is essentially you can always tell when you have, oak is usually, uh, usually identify oak because it has kind of like um, those spicy, woody kind of like coffee notes a lot of times or chocolate or things like that. Um, like I mentioned with the American oak, you're going to get kind of a coconut dill possibly. Um, and then with French oak, you get more cinnamon, um, warming spices, things like that. The clay is, uh, while it might be used, it is also kind of the, um, uh, clay is coming back into fashion kind of all over the world right now, <laughs> as is cement, but it's not as much of that. Yes, clay using some Oregon Riesling, kind of cool. The clay is a fascinating vessel, and I think um, winemakers are really starting to have fun with it. Clay was, of course, one of the original aging vessels uh, in Europe, in Italy, uh, very particularly, um, but also with the Romans. I mean, clay was a very common, it, it was something they could make. So the, uh, <laughs> the enjoyment of clay being rediscovered, uh, similar to like those, uh, the cement eggs, and things like that. If anyone's been visiting a lot of wineries in California or in Paso, you start to see those, the cement eggs. It's really, really fun. Uh, aging wine, it's, it's just a miraculous thing that has come full circle essentially, which is pretty cool. Okay. You know, George, that's a great question because uh, clay doesn't really impart flavor, right? So the difference between clay and oak in terms of um, aromas is that oak does tend to, especially new oak, will um, impart flavor to your wine. And that tends to be, again, that vanilla and um, warming spices, cooking spices from French oak, and sort of that coconut and dill uh, notes from American oak. Um, definitely tune in uh, later this month when we talk about oak. And I will also then kind of mention some of those other aging vessels like clay, like cement, and why those are so different and how oak is really its own kind of um, specific uh, kind of, um, it is why it is so important in so much winemaking throughout the world, right? Because really they do that. They do, they, uh, they may char the oak. It's the same as anywhere when you're aging your wines in oak, you have a wide range of toasting options available. So char is kind of your highest level, charred oak, 
charred American oak, for example, is what you use on bourbon, right? <laughs> so in America, and that is where you get your strongest flavor because the more you toast the inside of that barrel, um, the more you're releasing and sort of caramelizing the actual flavor components and creating kind of a charcoal on, essentially on the inside that will then impart those flavors into the wine during the aging process. So if you do a light toast, for example, you're not gonna get quite as um, intense of those flavors being imparted into your wine. However, once you've used a new oak barrel, no matter how it's been toasted, uh, basically three times, you essentially kind of strip it of all of those flavor, uh, flavor imparting um, abilities. So it's a very, very, um, it's a very, very uh, narrow window of time uses that you can have for those barrels, which is why you'll tend to see um, those barrels are expensive, but they have to get replaced. If you want new French oak, you got to buy a new barrel because it makes a difference in terms of how it tastes, the aromas that are in the wine, and uh, essentially your final product, right? Okay, I think that's it. Um, I wanted to say thank you guys again. I'm going to let you all go. I, it's already a good old, uh, <laughs> a whole hour. I kind of kept you over today, but thank you guys so much. If you have questions, always feel free to email me anytime. I'm here. All right. Take care, everyone. Salud. <laughs>